symptomology that's going to tell you it's cardiac. Position. Mm -hmm. Okay. What else? Radiation. Duration. Radiation. What else? Aggravating system. Mm -hmm. What else? Intensity. Might. May not. But what else? The quality. Is it pressure like sharp, stabbing? What else? What else? What about the associated symptoms? Nausea, vomiting, dyspnea, yes. orthopnea, diaphoresis. Yes. All these things are very important to find out. Okay? What if your patient comes in with chest pain and they they have like these bug eyes, their eyes are sticking out of their head, like totally big and bug and their lids are retracted. Like, we're thinking, okay, what the heck? Let me look at your neck. Yes, it's you yes. can have hyperthyroidism. Hyperthyroidism. And what's going on? Just another bomb. Mm -hmm. Okay? So we have to really take a good history so we can figure out what's going on with the patient and why they're having this chest pain. Okay? It's not just about, okay, oh, well, you have chest pain, you're going to stop on the EEG and give you some nitro. It's a little bit more than that. Okay? For, uh, performing the cardiovascular exam, probably one of the easiest exams that you're going to do, but still, it entails a lot because. I just talked to you about a situation of a patient that came in where uh, myocardial chest pain that had bug eyes, right? So that person, I need to assess the thyroid. Yes. Don't I? Mm -hmm. Is that part of your cardiovascular exam? Mm -hmm. No, but it's a part of the exam when a person comes in with cardiovascular chest, with chest pain due to a metabolic um, problem, okay? So when we talk about, um, and we're going to do next week, we're going to do um, a full history and deduce all the components of the exam. This week we're going to just go through um, what you're going to do and what the sounds are and everything like that. Next week we're going to kind of detail it a little bit more. Okay? Um, interpreting heart sounds. Murmurs. Very important. Okay? You want to know what type of murmur, where it's coming from, uh, what's causing the murmur, when is it worse, when is it better, what are the associated symptoms with the murmur. You need to know those things too. Okay? When the murmur is going. And then, um, is there a click? Is there a mid systolic click? Is there S1, S2, and S3, or S4? Okay? Which can give you an indication of if there's a stiff ventricular wall or if there is too much fluid there. Okay? That can give you some extra hard sounds. So we're going to talk about all these things. All right? Physical exam. Inspection. Why do we need to inspect the um, chest cavity? Why? Trauma. Okay? If somebody comes in with chest pain and um, they have this big bruise on their chest wall, it's being musculoskeletal. Okay? Or it could be a cardiac contusion because they were just in an accident and they have this big uh, <coughs> bruise here, but guess what? When they had, when they got that hit, they also had a cardiac infusion associated with it, okay? So that's, that's um, something we have to look at. Pectus evactum or craniotum, sunken chest or chest, um, chest wall that's caved in, or um, we can also have the, um, the chest wall that's open too much, or we can have a shield chest. Um, they almost look like they're wearing a um, armor, um, the, the shield chest type of person. And that's usually associated with, um, I can't remember the name of it, um, Turner syndrome. Those are the people you usually see with their, the shield chest looking. They almost look like they're wearing that, um, like that, that guard wear. Oh, they were in the breast Like a breast, or something, right? Jugular venous distension, jugular vein. Why do we need to assess the jugular veins? Fluid status, tell us the fluid status. It doesn't have to be just bulging, it can be sunken too. Okay, if it's sunken, that tells us that they're dry. If it's bulging, it tells us that they're overloaded on fluid. So if they're overloaded, we need to decrease the amount of fluid. If they don't have enough, we gotta give them fluid. All these things can actually cause a patient to have myocardial ischemia. Because if you don't have any fluid circulating, if you are lost a lot of blood, you're gonna have chest pain. Because you're anemic. And if you're anemic, 
you don't have enough red blood cells to supply enough oxygen to the myocardium. If you can't supply enough oxygen to the myocardium, you're going to have microbial ischemia. You're going to have chest pain. Okay, that's associated with the angina. Okay, so that's very important to know. Right-sided versus um, left-sided. Okay, if we have right-sided heart symptoms, what are we going to see, Erica? Right-sided heart symptoms. JVD. Mm -hmm. huh? I want you to remember. I want you to remember a few things. JVD, hepatosplenomegaly, mm -hmm. and peripheral edema. Mm -hmm. Three things. The minute we say right side, I want you to remember JVD, hepatosplenomegaly, and peripheral edema. Those things should be like popping in your brain when we say right side. When we say left side, what do we want to hear? Shutness of breath. Good in the lungs. So Shutness of breath. Dyspnea. Okay? Orthopnea. Paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea. All those things will tell us that there's fluid in the lung. Okay? So left sided, pulmonary. Right sided, peripheral. JDD, hepatosplenomegaly, peripheral edema, right side. So if we're talking about somebody having peripheral edema. We're talking about right-sided heart failure. Mm -hmm. If we're talking about somebody who um, palpate their abdomen and you can actually feel the liver and you feel like a fluid shift over the liver, right you know it's right-sided heart failure. Okay? So your JVD, hepatosplenomegaly, peripheral edema, right side. Left side, we're talking about pulmonary, lungs. Okay? What's the number one cause of left, um, right-sided heart failure? Left side. Left side. Mm -hmm. Okay? We know. Left side usually comes and then it goes to the right. Okay? All right. Pericardial disease. They can have two small signs. Paroxysmal increase in JVD due to inspiration. Okay? So they take a deep breath. All of a sudden their jugular vein just gets distended tremendously. Okay? That tells you that they have a, um, um, what you call it, uh, pericardial disease. So they can have what we call a um, pericarditis. So we can have a constrictive pericarditis, okay? That can actually constrict the heart this much so that every time um, the heart tries to pump, nothing can go in because there's so much tension on the heart, okay? That you can't get anything in. The preload is crap because nothing can get in because the heart is being squished. Okay. okay, and that's usually constrictive heart failure. Okay, so you have no input, no output. Okay, um, hepatojugular reflex. Okay, it's another thing that you want to look for when you want to look to see what um, the fluid status is. <clears throat> so, if when we push on the stomach, you see that the JVP, uh, the jugular venous pressure, increases greater than four, you know that they probably have fluid flow. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. So, <clears throat> chest pain evaluation. We want to know how long they've had chest pain. Because that will tell us if they're having their mind or if they're just having angina. Okay? We want to know the characteristics of the chest pain. We want to know um, what is this associated with. We talked about that. Okay? Um, <clears throat> tearing pain that goes to the back. Dissection. Aortic dissection. It's a ripping pain that goes to their back. What's the first thing you have to do or worry about when someone comes in with an aortic dissection? Mm -hmm. Blood pressure. Mm -hmm. Okay? Because mm -hmm. guess what? If their blood pressure is high, what's happening? The blood is pouring out oh, yes. of that vessel yes. into the thoracic cavity. Yes. We got to bring the blood pressure down as low as possible. We can perfuse them, but the blood pressure has to be as low as it can. Okay. What else? Um, <clears throat> pleuritic pain. What will give you pleuritic pain? Pneumonia. Pneumonia. What else? Pericarditis. Pulmonary embolism. Mm -hmm. Very common. Someone comes in, they're hypoxic, they're having pleuritic chest pain. When they take a deep breath, they have this stabbing pain, they're tachycardic, and they have no O2 sac. The first thing you should be thinking is this person has a PE. Mm -hmm. yep. Okay? Because the number one sign of PE is 
is usually hypoxia because that pulmonary artery is clogged, so no blood flow is going there. So usually they're hypoxic. Right? Dizziness and syncope. What can give you dizziness and syncope? A lot of different things. Remember, a syncopal event is usually lack of perfusion to the brain. So any condition that decreases blood flow output can give you a syncopal episode. Okay? So let's say the person has aortic stenosis. Okay? If that person has an aortic stenosis, that means that the aortic valve is stenosed and blood can't get out of that part to the periphery. If blood can't get out to the periphery, it can't get out to the brain. So someone who comes in with syncope, you really have to do an echo because you have to look at the heart valves. You have to see what's going on with the heart valves because that's one of the number one parts. The two signs and symptoms of aortic stenosis are angina and syncope. Okay? A little old man, 75 years old, was gardening outside. He passed out and had some chest pain. You need to look up there, right? And get the valves. He's probably aortic stenosis. Okay? So, position of the heart. You always remember the heart lies in the, um, the thoracic cavity, upside down and backwards. Okay, the base is at the top, the apex is at the bottom. Okay, so it's in the heart, upside, it's in the body, upside down and backwards. Okay, the base, always at the top, apex, always at the bottom, apex points towards the left. Okay. When we look for where the eight, a little powerful one. Oh, yeah. Okay. So this is your sternum. You have your sternum notch, which is right here, and the aorta sits right behind your sternum notch, right here. Right. Then you have the apex of the heart, which is down here. The apex points. Uh, outwards towards the, the the left lateral area of the heart, of the body. You have the apex here, you have the um, aortic notch, um, you have the sternal notch, and right below the sternal notch sits the aorta. Okay? Um, you have the right side of the heart and the left side of the heart. You have the top of the heart, okay, and then the back, you have the bottom of the heart, and then you have the inferior portion. Well, important to know because you have to know which coronary artery vessels feed where. And you have to know which coronary artery vessels feed where because then you want to know when you're looking at an EKG and they say that the inferior aspect of the heart is being affected, you have to know which lead looks at the inferior aspect of the heart and then you have to know which vessel feeds the inferior, inferior aspect of the heart. Right? When you're looking at an EKG, an EKG is like taking a picture. Okay? No matter what they tell you, it's like, always think of it in your head as a camera. So when you're taking a picture of the heart, it's like, when I take a picture of myself, um, my left is facing my picture's right, my right is facing my picture's left, okay? It's the same thing. If I'm taking your picture this way, I'm looking at the anterior aspect, or I'm, I can be looking at the lateral aspect, if I'm taking a picture right across, I'm looking at the anterior aspect and the septum. If I'm taking a picture from the bottom up, I'm looking at the inferior aspect of the heart. Okay? Make sense? Inferior, bottom. I say that all the time and some people still get it wrong. Anterior, inferior, lateral. Posterior is in the back. Okay? And when I talk about what leads to where in a little bit. So again, apex beats against the chest wall. Your point of maximum impulse is at the apex. Your point of maximum impulse is seven to nine centimeters left of your, um, your what do you call this? Sternal border. So it's seven to nine centimeters left of your sternal border. That should be where you can palpate your point of. What is this thing? Your point of maximum impulse. You gotta learn the, the clicker in your mind. So, when you're looking for your point of maximum impulse, 
Usually, when you're assessing a patient and you're trying to find a point of maximal impulse, you're gonna go 7 to 9 centimeters left of the sternal border, okay? And you're gonna palpate in that area. When you're palpating the point of maximum impulse, you want a person to actually lean towards that left side so that the, the apex of the heart can actually hit up against the, um, the rib cage, okay? And we're gonna do that in a few minutes. We're gonna get um, everybody to get up and these practices on each other. Uh, I'm not in the lab, I'm very picky with my students, when I'm grading my students. I like to make sure that they do it the right way. And so I like to teach my students the way I want you to do it. And so if you're grading your, page, uh, your, your video, and you tell me, oh no, but the lab person told me to do it this way, I'm gonna be like, I don't care. I showed you in class. That's the way I want you to do it, okay? So, I don't care what they tell me, just say, this is what Dr. Morton told me to do, mm -hmm. and this is the way I'm going to do it. Okay? And if they have a problem, they can always ask me. Oh. <laughs> but I want you to do it the way, the right way, and so I'm going to teach you the way you should do it in class. So that's what we're going to practice in class. Okay. Systole and diastole. Which one's the longest phase? Systole or diastole? Diastole. Systole is only one third of the cardiac cycle. Mm -hmm. The other two thirds is diastole. Mm -hmm. Okay? And why do diastole need to be longer than systole? Filling time. Filling time. Mm -hmm. Filling time. And what also happens in diastole? Relaxation. When do the coronary vessels get perfused? Oh. During diastole. Okay? Mm -hmm. So if we shorten diastole, we can have myocardial ischemia, okay? So what happens when our heart rate is pumping 150 beats per minute? We don't have time to fill. We don't have time to fill. If we don't have time to fill, what usually happens? We get ischemed, right? It always makes me laugh when I walk into a unit and I look at the monitor and the patient's heart rate is 140. And I say to the nurse, can you see that the heart rate is 140? And they say, oh, it's been like that all night. Because that person is probably experiencing my cardiac ischemia at this point because I'm, we've shortened drastically the filling time. So all we have is compassion and the heart just needs time to fill. The heart just needs time to fill. Okay? And it takes me laugh because she's going to think about these things. Okay? Atrial um, systole occurs during ventricular diastole. Ventricular systole occurs during atrial diastole. Make sense? Make sense? Yeah, yes. Okay. Sternal notch. Okay. It's also called the angular Louis. Okay. And <clears throat> this is located right at your second, um, your second in the costal space. Okay right on the top of that little notch area right here, okay? Now, key landmarks, look at me. Right, second in the costal space, uh, right of the sternal border, aortic. Second in the costal space, left of the sternal border, pulmonic. Third intercostal space, left of the sternal border, herbs point. Fourth to fifth intercostal space, left of the sternal border, tricuspid. Fifth intercostal space, mid clavicular line, mitral. Now, when you're doing your exam and you're examining the patient, we like to know that you know where your landmarks are. So you have to say to the patient, now I'm going to examine your heart. I'm going to listen to your valves of your heart, okay? And you have to go, I'm going to your second intercostal space, right of your sternal border, to assess for the aortic valve. Now I'm going to the second intercostal space, left of your sternal border, to assess for your pulmonic valve. You're going to say that to this patient. Now I'm going to go to the 
third is the cost of space left of the sternum order to assess for your herbs point. Now I'm going to go to your fourth to fifth is the cost of space, right in the middle of that, left of the sternum order to assess for your husband valve. Now I'm going to go fifth into costal space, mid clavicula line to assess for your mitral line. Okay? And when you do that, you have to do it first with the diaphragm of the stethoscope to listen for high pitched sounds. And then you're going to have to do it with the bell of your stethoscope to listen for low pitched sounds. That's a test question. We ask you what the diaphragm is for, and we ask you what the bell is for. The diaphragm, high pitch. The bell, low pitch. Low pitch are murmurs, rubs, gallops, bell. Okay? Somebody gave, showed me a stethoscope a little while ago and said, is this okay? Yes. I love this. Okay, so this is what you do not do. So you're listening to the patient part, and you say, I'm going to go to the right Second intercostal space, uh, right of the sternal border to listen to aorta. Then I'm gonna go second intercostal space, and you're using the diaphragm. I'm using the diaphragm to listen for high pitch sounds. And you have a stethoscope like this. And then you go, now I'm gonna use the bell, and you do this. Five points gone. This is not the bell. This is a cardiology stethoscope, and you press it firmly for the diaphragm and lightly for the bell. Okay? So you have a stethoscope like this, you press firmly for the diaphragm and lightly, and lightly for the bell. Okay? Again, you see it? Nothing. Metal. You hear zero. Zip. Zilch. Nada. Diaphragm. Firm. Bell. Light. Diaphragm, firm, bell, light. Diaphragm, high pitch, bell, low pitch. Okay? Murmurs, bell. Okay? Rubs, bell. Gallops, bell. Okay? So I'm listening for murmurs, rubs, gallops, and using the bell. So I'm just listening for your heart tones, I'm using the diaphragm. Okay? Make sense? All right. Um, so part of your masculine anatomy, I always make myself do this. No matter which class it is, you're going to have to tell me blood flow through the heart. Always. You have to tell me exactly how blood flows through the heart. And the reason you have to do that is because you cannot tell me what a murmur is, where a murmur is, if you don't know which valves are weird have to know blood flow through the heart. So I'm going to pick on cat. Blood flow through the heart cat. But she was in my papa class and they had to all recite it for me. Uh, blood start, blood goes. Come on, come on, come on. They can't hear you. Blood flows from the superior cava to the right. And inferior vena cava. Inferior vena cava to the right atrium to the right ventricle. Uh, through, 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 through. Okay. Let's go again. Blood flows through the inferior and superior vena cava through the right atrium through the tricuspid valve to the right ventricle to the pulmonary valve to the pulmonary artery to the lungs back to the pulmonary veins to the pulmonary aortic valve. It went to the aortic valve and then go through the ventricle and the atrium. Yeah, I think left, so, right? Left atrium to the mitral valve to the left ventricle to the aortic valve coronary and the I want you to remember that like it's like a back of your hand. If I say to you, blood flow through your heart, I need you to say blood flows from the superior and inferior vena cava to the right atrium, through the tricuspid valve, through the right ventricle, through the pulmonary valve, to the pulmonary arteries, through the lungs, then through the pulmonary veins, through the left atrium, then through the mitral valve, through the left ventricle, then the aortic valve, through the aorta, to the valve, and 
I need you to be able to say that to me. Like that. And I usually do this on my final exams where I give you a question and I make sure that you can, and it's not in the exam, it's on a separate piece of paper. And you have to explain something to me in order to get five points. And if you can explain it explicitly, you get five points. You don't know what I'm going to ask you. So I think you'll learn all of it. It's not included in your test score. It's five extra points. So it behooves you to do that kind of stuff. Yes. Blood flow through the heart is very important. You must know it, like the back of your hand. Okay? Because when we talk about murmurs, it's going to help you to understand the different types of murmurs and how they help. Okay? Um, you don't have that slide? Did she say she didn't have that slide? Oh. Uh, did I not tell you guys not to download my PowerPoint until an hour before class? I just learned that. Oh, okay. Don't download my PowerPoint until an hour before class. I'm always working on it. Don't print it either. You're wasting trees. Yeah. Fair for the environment. All right? It's my fault. You can put it on my eval. It's on every eval for sure. <laughs> my fault. Be like, she doesn't really use her PowerPoint sometimes. They know. They haven't fired me yet. So it's okay. You know, you can put it there if you want. Hold it against me. It's okay. It's not going to change. Um, so we talked about blood flow through the heart. I need you to know. What are your AV valves, and where are they? What are your AV valves? Chest, puppet, and mitral. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And what are your semilunar valves? Pulmonary yeah. and aortic. Pulmonic and aortic. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. All right. Your AV valves, blood is flowing into the ventricle. Okay. So it's your atrioventricular valve. If you remember what AV means, you'll never get it wrong. Atrioventricular. You know it's the valve between the atrium and the ventricle. Okay? Your semilunar valve take blood either to the lungs. To the body or to the lungs. Yeah. Okay? Don't ever forget that. Make sure you remember that. Okay? This is another picture of the heart. Beautiful organ. It's just a pump. That's all it is. It's just a pump. All your heart nurses. It's just a pump. Is it more beautiful than Understand the brain? Understand where flow goes. Sorry. Is it more beautiful than the brain? Oh, heck no. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever seen a brain? Oh my god, that thing is gorgeous. That gray matter. <laughs> Be still my heart. <laughs> Be still my heart. Anyways, so we talked about this already. We talked about where the, um, the valves are and where we place the stethoscope to listen to them. If you give you one a mnemonic, all physicians equally take money. They, they make all those things up, you know. I want you to know exactly where they are. I want you to say the rib space. I want to say sternal border. I want you to say exactly where they are, okay? All physicians equally take money. If you want to remember that, that's fine. But guess what? You're going to be like, where is that physician? Mm -hmm. I, yeah, getting money from where? So getting money from the right where, you know? I need you to remember where to place the stethoscope. Okay? Can I ask a question? Yes, ma'am. My, my, my cardiac is my favorite one. I'm so when she, she puts her, her stethoscope here. She's listening to the carotid. And says breathe and, or, and don't breathe. Exactly. She's listening to the carotid. Okay. She's auscultating the carotid artery. Um, when you auscultate the carotid artery, if you're breathing when you're auscultating the carotid artery, it gives you a, like a, a back row noise. You can't really tell if there's a bruit or a thrill. You palpate it. I'm sorry, it's a bruit. You will palpate a thrill 
you ask them to agree. Well, okay. Another question. In, sure. In the documentation, uh, the only part of, of the assessment I can't do on the notes is the cardiac, uh, the cardiologist. But we're meeting it, they, they say uh, one over six or two over six. Okay, we're gonna talk about those murmurs in a few minutes. That's greeting the murmurs, okay? So we'll talk about those in a few minutes. All right, so mechanical activity. Remember, electrical activity precedes mechanical activity, okay? Can we have electrical activity without mechanical activity? Yes. Of course, that's why we have PEAs, okay? Can we have mechanical activity without electrical activity? No. 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 Because the impulse starts in the F, as the SA node fires, okay? okay? Mm -hmm. So we cannot have mechanical activity without electrical activity, but we can have electrical activity with no mechanical activity, okay? Mm -hmm. um, that's why we have PARS. So always remember that, okay? Just to go into this a little bit, just so you guys get a, a good understanding of this, Preload versus afterload. Very important for you to understand these concepts. Preload is a degree of stretch. I'm looking for my rubber bands. lovely demonstration of um, Frank Stalin's law. This little tiny rubber band, if I stretch it, God, please don't let it hit anybody because I don't have any money. <laughs> don't let it hit me either. Last time it hit me in the face, it was not nice. Okay? This, if I pull this, it's not going to go to you, I swear. I promise. <laughs> I'm <gonna> let it. <laughs> it never happens the way I want it to. Okay? This stretch, I let go. Where we go? Backwards. But it actually went far, right? Oh, that's the one. Now this one, if I do the same thing, I let go, probably won't go any further. I do that because the the more distensibility the myocardium has, and the more stretch it gets with that distensibility, the greater the force of contraction will be. The bulkier the heart is, you can fill it up as much as possible, but if it doesn't have that good distensibility, the rebound or the, the force of contraction is still gonna be low. So you can have increased preload and have really bad um, um, stroke volume because of the fact that you have a buggy heart. And we'll talk about what that means in a little bit, okay? Um, or you can have a good amount of preload and you have a good, nice, distensible heart, which will give you 
nice stroke volume because your, the myocardial stretch is really good. Myocardial stretch equals the force of contraction. So if you have good distensibility and you stretch the heart and you give a whole lot of preload, that ejection force is gonna be really high because you have good distensibility. Now if I have a heart that is uh, post streptococcus infection or I have a heart that had um, um, like in heart failure, so they have um, a heart that's completely boggy, the distensibility of the heart and the stretch is going to be much lower. So the force of contraction will be a lot less, okay? That's why people with, um, I'm sorry? To Kasubi heart, is the same, it's the same thing, we have heart failure. It actually, they call it that, to Kasubi heart, or um, I'm not probably gonna say it right, because it actually, when that heart, uh, they call it um, stress-induced um, heart failure, and they usually get a heart that looks almost like that Japanese fish, fishnet. Um, that's why it's called Tsukusubi, because it's, it's named after the Japanese fishnet. But their heart, um, it, it gets this shape of the Japanese fishnet, and it's actually a stress-induced um, heart failure. It usually happens to, um, it can happen, they call it broken heart syndrome, um, you can actually get heart failure from broken heart because your heart gets a whole lot of, you're under a lot of stress. So when you're under a lot of stress, what usually happens, um, your autonomic nervous system goes into high gear. When your autonomic nervous system goes into high gear, you release your hormones. You release epinephrine, norepinephrine, and you also release a whole lot of cortisol because your heart, your, your hormones are responding to your body's stress. It's like, okay, something's going on, I have to do something about it. And that's what your, your body is releasing on. Epinephrine, norepinephrine, all this stuff. And then it's creating this, this dynamic where you have a lot of epinephrine and norepinephrine, you have peripheral vascular vasoconstriction, and the heart has to fight against all that vas um, vasoconstriction from the epinephrine and norepinephrine. So if your heart is fighting against that increased afterload, what usually ends up happening is that your heart end up in a failure because it has to pump against that pressure for all this long time. So then you end up with this distensible heart and it actually assumes the shape of that Tukasubi, that Japanese fishnet, okay? And it's called broken heart syndrome. People actually die from it. It's not a fable. Um, it's, yeah, you can go into really bad heart failure. Um, I actually had a friend who has a friend who actually had it and was in the ICU for months because she was mourning over her son. Okay? So when we're talking about preload, we're talking about the volume of blood in the ventricles at the end of diastole. So the amount of blood that I have going back to the heart in the atria that's going to fill the ventricle at the end of diastole, that's going to give me that nice stretch so that I can pump it out. Okay? If I have a little bit of blood going into that ventricle, it's not going to stretch the ventricle enough to give me that nice distensibility and that pump mm -hmm. to give me enough of a um, stroke volume to give me enough of a cardiac output. Make sense? Yes. Now, afterload is peripheral vascular resistance. So, if my um, peripheral vascular resistance, if I have increased hypertension, what usually happens is that all the vessels in my extremities are clamped down. Mm -hmm. So if everything is clamped down and the heart's trying to pump against it, the heart has to work harder. Mm -hmm. It has to work really, really hard. Mm -hmm. So the higher your systemic vascular resistance is, the harder the heart has to work. Mm -hmm. The harder the heart has to work, you end up with the um, eccentric heart failure. We're gonna talk about that in a little bit also. Mm -hmm. Okay, does that make sense guys? Yes. So, stroke volume. Cat, you're not paying attention to me, so you usually get called when you do that. The intense blood pumps by the left ventricle of the heart in pump contraction. The stroke volume is not all the blood contained in the left ventricle. So, what I have right here, there will be about two thirds of the blood in the ventricle that's felt to each Okay. Remember, you have end diastolic volume. Okay, and end systolic volume. Your end diastolic volume is the amount of blood that's in the ventricle at the end of diastole. 
your end systolic volume, the end of the amount of blood in the ventricle at the end of systole. Okay. What's your ejection fraction? The amount of blood that is sent to the systolic circulation cycle. Okay. So if you have a um, ejection fraction of thirty percent, what does that mean? Systolic heart failure. Both. Okay, so what's end systolic volume? End systolic volume. The amount of that remains okay. in so the what's left ventricle. Ejection fraction. The first, the, the rate. Look, look. Okay, I'm going to say it again. You say to me that. Ejection fraction, if a person has an ejection fraction of 30%, that means only 30% of what should be expelled is expelled. Mm -hmm. oh. And we say that end systolic volume is the amount of blood that's left in the volume in the heart at the end of systole. Mm -hmm. So is ejection fraction and end systolic volume about the same? Yes. yes. They give you a same? Yes. 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 Because if your end systolic volume is 90 and it should be, 30, that means you have an ejection, a low ejection fraction, because you're keeping too much blood in the heart at the end of systole. Okay? So if you have a large end systolic volume, you're going to have a low ejection fraction. Does that make sense? Yes. It's like the difference. If you have a large end systolic volume, you have a less Exactly. Lower. But, yes. But this the relation, the, so the relation <coughs> is, no. they go hand in hand. Uh -huh. Because your ejection fraction has to be good for your end systolic volume to be less. You don't want your end systolic volume to be high. You want your end systolic volume to be low. You don't want blood to be left back in the ventricle at the end of systole. Mm -hmm. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes. So they go hand in hand. Okay? You measure one and you have a low ejection fraction, you know your end systolic volume is it's high. high. Mm -hmm. Okay? We talk about preload and afterload. Increased preload equals the increased stress of the muscle, which leads to the increased force of um, contraction. contraction, which leads to increased stroke volume. That was what I was trying to imitate with my um, rubber band here. It kind of went that way. The big one went that way, and the small one went that way. But you know, you understood the concept. Epic fail? Yes. You understood the concept. <laughs> Got it. Okay. Um, the more preload you have, the more stretch of the muscle, the more contractibility, especially if you have an intact myocardium. Okay. Uh, the less preload, if you don't have a good stretch, your force of contraction is going to be less and your uh, stroke volume is going to be less, and then your cardiac output is going to be less. So if you want to decrease the work on the heart, you want to give a medication that decreases the preload? No. Relaxes your heart muscles. If you, have, if you have something wrong with your <coughs> heart muscle, then you can do that because you have, like if you have a heart attack, or you have, if you have um, heart failure, um, where the heart's not pumping properly, then at that point, you want to decrease your preload because the heart is keeping the fluid in there, okay? If the heart's not putting it out and you're putting more in, it may not be able to expel it enough, which can go back into your lungs, which can cause your issues, okay? So it's, it's a delicate balance. Does that make sense? Do that, okay? Um, <coughs> uh, Venus return. Slow heartbeat and exercise increases venous return to the heart. How does that happen? Increased venous return equals increase in end diastolic volume, which, and decrease in venous return um, can also equal decrease in end diastolic volume. Oh, does that make sense? If I have less blood going back to the heart, I am going to have less end diastolic, end diastolic volume. If I have more blood going back to the heart, I'm gonna have more end diastolic volume. Does that make sense? End diastolic volume is the end, uh, the amount of blood that's left in the ventricle at the end of diastole. Okay? 
Do not get tripped up on EDD or E. Do not get tripped up on that. End diastolic volume. If you see EDD, you know it's end diastolic volume, and in your head you're gonna say it's the amount of blood in the ventricle at the end of diastole. Mm -hmm. End systolic volume is the amount of blood in the ventricle at the end of systole. Systole is contraction, diastole is relaxation, okay? So if you remember those things, you can actually decipher into any test question. I need you to be able to understand the concepts so you can understand the questions, okay? Make sense? The cardiac cycle, nobody likes to know this, okay? But I need to know what's open when and what's closed when, okay? It's very important for you to know what happens during systole. Which valves are open during systole? Seven lunar valves, okay? Which valves are open during diastole? The AV valves, okay? Diastole is spinning, systole is contracting. Okay, so if we're looking at the cardiac cycle, we want to look at what's happening when. Okay, so atrial systole. Atrial systole <coughs> is when the SA node fires, the atria contracts, and then you get that um, blood goes into the ventricle from the atria. Now, one thing I want you to understand is that. The ventricle gets blood from the atria through a passive kind of motion, okay? It goes by pressure gradients, okay? So if the blood in the ventricle is less than the blood in the atria, the AV valves are gonna passively open and let blood come from the atria into the ventricle. Now this oops, is very important. Your atrial kick is what that contraction of the atria is. And that's that last 20% of blood that goes from the atria into the ventricle to actually give you that amount of volume that needs to be in the ventricle prior to ventricular contraction, okay? So it's that last squeeze that happens. In order for you to have an atrial kick, you have to have an intact SA node. I'm gonna say that again. In order for you to have an atrial kick, your SA node has to be intact. So, which patients don't have an atrial kick? AFib. If you have a patient with atrial fibrillation, they will not have an atrial kick. Okay? That's why most of your patients with atrial fibrillation are in heart failure. they will not have an atrial kick. Because your SA node, when you have atrial fibrillation, is dysfunctional. It's dysfunctional, okay? So that last 20% don't get kicked into the ventricle, okay? So those people with AFib or A flutter, those people will not have an atrial kick, okay? Atrial diastole usually occurs during ventricular systole. Ventricular systole is that contraction phase. Semilunar valves open, that goes to the heart, I mean to the, the body, to the brain during ventricular systole. Ventricular diastole is the relaxation phase, phase where blood is passively going from the atria to the ventricle. And then you get that last prior in the SA node, and you get that 20, that last 20%, which is the atrial kick, and it gives you that last, that full 100% um, blood, blood that comes from the atria into the ventricle. Mm -hmm. Okay, so 80% passive, 20% atrial kick. Make sense? All right. I think we said all of this. Atrial systole pumps only about 20% of the blood. That's that atrial kick that you get at the end, okay? Remember, filling of the ventricular system is a passive pressure 
height up there. That usually happens. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry? Ventricular filling. Ventricular filling. So atrial contraction, atrial contraction on your um, your EKG looks like what? Your P wave. Mm -hmm. Who doesn't have a P wave? F -fib. F -fib. F -fib. People who don't have ventricular um, atrial contraction, right? Our atrial kick is gone. Okay. So AV valves are open when the ventricle is filling, okay? Aortic valves is closed when the ventricle is filling. Because if the um, aortic valve was open when the ventricle was filling, so just flow straight through, okay? So you have atrial contraction phase. When you have atrial contraction phase, what's going on? The ventricle is filled completely. And that actually creates a pressure gradient, okay? Because now, the valves are closed, blood can't go back up. Mm -hmm. So now the ventricle is like tight. Mm -hmm. So the only thing it can do is squeeze blood through the semilunar valves or into pulmonic valve or the valve. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. So you have now systole. What's going on during systole? What are your AV valves doing during systole? They're closed. Okay, and your semilunar valves are open. Because blood has to go out to the body. Mm -hmm. What on your EKG 
indicates systole. The QRS. Okay, that represents the ventricular contraction. This is what this big little thing looks like. That's blood pouring out of the ventricle, okay, during systole. Right? Then the aortic valve closes. This is your isometric phase right about here, where the pressure gradient between everything is about the same. Okay? And once that happens, uh, it just happens for a short period of time, and then blood just, uh, then that, that pressure gradient gets less when the AV valves uh, open again, and blood pours into the ventricular system. So basically, all I want you to know is what's happening when. Okay? With these diagrams, I don't believe they make it to memorize it. I don't think it's worth anything. You just need to know what the basis of um, the cardiac cycle is and what's going on when. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Same thing again. I did it in three ways. Don't worry about it. Cardiac output. What is your cardiac output? The amount of blood pumped by each ventricle in one minute. Everybody says this, and then I get people to try to conceptualize it, and they don't. Cardiac output is heart rate times stroke volume. Everybody can recite that to me. But what does that mean? What does that mean to people? Okay. That sounds beautiful. Okay, so... What's the normal cardiac output? That's about six. Usually about five to eight, depending on who you are. We look at cardiac index more, but like 2.5, okay? Cardiac index is more accurate because if my cardiac output is five mLs per hour and Shaq's cardiac output is five mLs per hour, one of us in trouble. Probably not me, <laughs> right? Because he's like seven foot three something, yeah. and like three hundred or something pounds. If we have the same cardiac output, somebody's having cardiac ischemia. Somebody's having some ischemia, and it's not me. Okay. Um, so when we look at cardiac output, it says heart rate times stroke <coughs> volume. Heart rate times stroke volume beats per minute times mLs per beat. Right? This is very important to understand because if you understood this, your patient would never have a heart rate of 140 for a long period of time. Because you would understand this. So when we say cardiac output and mole per minute, heart rate is 75 beats per minute, and your stroke volume is 70 mLs per beat. Your cardiac output is 5.25 liters per minute. Mm -hmm. If your heart rate is 150 beats per minute, mm -hmm. your stroke volume increases to 120 mLs per beat. Mm -hmm. Your cardiac output is 18 liters per minute. Good Lord. Good Lord. Mm -hmm. Poor lady. Wow. Um, mm -hmm. What happens to my filling time here? I ain't got none. Mm -hmm. I'm filling, so how am I putting out 18, 18 liters per minute? Yeah. I'm not. But my body needs it to keep up with that heart rate, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's why we have to pay attention to the heart rate. Mm -hmm. Okay? Coronary circulation, very important for you to understand coronary circulation because when we um, do the basis of um, EKGs, I need you to know which arteries feed where, okay? So you have the left coronary artery, which bifurcates into your circumflex artery, and then your um, anterior, um, your AC, your anterior descending artery. I always, always go to the brain. <laughs> like, I would be talking about anterior descending, I'm telling you ACA, please. Just remember I'm a brain person. That's why. Okay? Huh? I'm gonna get her. I hope I break her confidency. She told me last week I was fat, now she's making comments from my brain. <laughs> she seriously did tell me I was fat last week. Okay? Then you have the right coronary artery.
artery. The right coronary artery feeds the inferior aspect of the heart. It feeds the um, posterior aspect of the heart. It feeds the right side of the heart, okay? The left um, coronary artery, the left main, actually bifurcates into the circumflex, which feeds the lateral aspect of the heart and the anterior aspect of the heart, okay? Um, your left anterior descendant feeds the anterior aspect of the heart and actually feeds the septum, okay? You have all these other ones, your um, left marginal, diagonal, all those, but I just need you to know the major ones, okay? Which means what? So you know they come off of the left or the right, the coronary artery. Okay? Your right coronary artery usually feeds the posterior aspect of the heart. But there are some people who are left circumflex dominant. Those people who are left circumflex dominant, the circumflex artery actually feeds the posterior aspect of the heart. Okay? Um, the left main actually bifurcates and it actually feeds the anterior and lateral. So if somebody infarcts up here, that's why they call them the widow maker. They take out the anterior aspect of the heart and the lateral aspect of the heart. And if they're circumflex dominant, they're dead because it takes out the posterior aspect of the heart also. Mm -hmm. Okay? The right coronary artery um, feeds the um, SA node. So if someone has a right coronary artery infarct, a lot of times they go into AFib really quick. Okay? Because if you take out the SA node, can't fire, they usually go into AFib. So somebody comes in with new onset AFib with chest pain, you're thinking it's the right coronary artery infarct because they knocked out their SA node, okay? The right coronary artery also feeds the AV node to a lesser, a lesser extent. So that can also be knocked out with the right coronary artery infarct. You wanna remember those? Hmm? They'll come in, yeah. Okay. So you want to remember those. When you're looking, and we're going to talk about the EKG um, a little bit. P waves. P waves equal the polarization of the atria. Okay. If someone has an intact SA node, they have an upright P wave in lead two. If someone does not have an upright P wave in lead two, something's probably wrong with their SA. QRS, ventricular depolarization, signals um, onset of ventricular contraction. SD segment is actually the time in which the entire ventricle is depolarized. Okay, so that's your SD segment. Your T wave is ventricular repolarization. We under understand what depolarization versus repolarization is, correct? Mm -hmm. Your PR interval is um, the amount of time it takes from atrial depolarization to ventricular depolarization, okay? And then your QT interval is the time it takes for the ventricles to undergo the entire cycle and then go back from depolarization to repolarization, okay? Make sense? So what it looks like, okay? T wave versus QRS, T wave, SD. SA node, pacemaker of the heart, heart rate from the, if it's coming from the SA node is 82 to 100 beats per minute. Your AV node um, is an action potential conducted slowly, it's actually more slower than the SA node, and it's usually about 40 to 60. 40 to 60. 40 to 60. Okay. Your bundle branches or your AV branches, it's usually less than 40. Okay. And usually these are the people who need to pacer, kind of massive intervention because none of their nodes are working and you can't sustain 40 feet per minute. You put kinji fibers, large diameter of muscles um, in the myocardium and it actually conducts an actual potential through the ventricular myocardium. Again, electrical activity must precede mechanical activity. You can have electrical activity without mechanical activity, but you can't have mechanical activity without electrical Okay, do you guys want to take a quick break? Yes. Quick. <coughs> you did not have health promotion, so I assume.